Hello everyone, welcome to our channel. Today we are going to talk about one of uh, Isma Chukta's short story collection. And this uh, this anthology was basically translated by Tahira Nakwi and Saida Saida S Hamid in English. And this collection yeah. has almost fifteen or sixteen, seventeen, seventeen short stories, including the half. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Isma Chuktai was uh, basically one of the most famous short story novelist, short story writers of 20th century, Urdu, in Urdu literature. Through her uh, short stories, she has always tried to voice the people who didn't really have a voice, especially focusing on uh, women. women and yeah, female uh, and sexuality. oppression. And, yes, yes. So if we talk... So when we read the in- introduction by these two writers, these two translators, this gives us a kind of knowledge about, you know, how uh, Isma Chuktai spent her days, um, childhood days, and how um, that contributed, all of those experiences that she had in her childhood kind of contributed to what she became as a writer. So, so when she was a child, she uh, she once like in this introduction is this mm. mention of uh, an incident where she is hiding um, below a bed uh, with her brother at a very young age. She does not know what is going. Uh, you know, every every woman in the women in the household a household is uh, kind of gossiping uh, uh, in and around. You know, there was this tradition or kind of a ritual in the house where they used to gossip women talks Mm -hmm. and uh, they used to hide uh, she and her brother used to hide under the bed and listen to those gossips and at the time she did not understand what was the topic they were generally sexual and they were generally some kind of a domestic sexual married uh, related to marriage kind of a gossip so um and but but at a later stage she kind of got to know uh, what they were all talking about and it was a forbidden topic so all that you know uh, we can see when she's narrating the stories as well I remember you telling me that uh that uh, that we see in her stories when when even um you know in Lihaf when she's explaining this uh, from a child's perspective everything yeah so that yeah. kind of a narration we see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's right. In, in in many points, we have also come across uh, very simple satires and yet so strong that she has used. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I I think we can go ahead ahead with the discussion on the veil. What do you say? Yeah. So the first story is the veil. Yeah. Gungat. That's that was Gungat, the real yeah. name. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So all those who are watching us, we are we are pretty sure that you have already uh, read this story or maybe listened to it because audiobooks are already available on YouTube. Uh, we have also uploaded an audiobook uh, on the same story. Let's start from the beginning, I guess. Yeah. So how how does the story uh, begin? So the story. So the story starts with this uh, anonymous narrator. We can take it as uh, yeah. the writer itself, uh, herself. And uh, she talks about her grandma, um, yeah. the condition yeah. of her grandma. So the grand, yeah. yeah. So maybe the granddaughter or the grandson. Child, yeah. yeah. And so uh, the description is, there's a description of the grandma and how uh, she looked very pale. Is it? Can we say that she looked pale? Whether she was yes, uh, yeah. There was this uh, line about yeah. So she uses uses this uh, phrase here, which is very uh, weird. It says, uh, "Grandma looked like an awkward mass of marble." Yeah, uh, as white so, as a sheet. Awkward mass of marble. So. Why has the writer used the phrase? Maybe to show sophisticatedness or to show that she was important 
awkward mass of marvel yeah so because uh, marvel is precious hmm maybe also marvel is white generally so maybe she is explaining like uh, you know that she was the condition that she is portraying is not good is actually yeah. not good we can say that yes um, uh, yeah it is it is pretty evident because the following uh, part of the sentence says it seemed as though there was not a single drop of blood in her body yeah so yeah it refers to paleness yeah okay um also all this all this uh, thing is apparently because she is an 80 year old virgin and we come to this reason here that she has never known the touch of a man's hand and that's why maybe that results to her being this way yeah yeah so how important is it to have those experiences as a woman um maybe that is something on the back of the narrator's mind oh my yeah yes that's right so uh, following that we come to know about the history behind the whole present uh, situation that we are talking about yeah. so we go back to the time when she was only 14 and mm. uh, when she got engaged to get the grandchild or the narrator's mother's uncle Uh, then we see the description of the bride and the bridegroom yeah and we can see how uh, the blackness and the fairness these two qualities have been contrasted mm-hmm. by and by and uh, here comes the male character called kalemia he enters yes. the story and the description of kalemia is that he is a stubborn immature 17 year old um at that time while the bride is 14 years old yes he is supposedly uh, he's uh, supposedly he is terrified of beauty he's terrified of how beautiful she is yes <laughs> so uh, usually it should be i mean it is usually the other way around isn't it yeah but here it's like he's scared and he he flees the way to jodhpur yeah so uh, can we say that he's filled with prejudice prejudice in the sense that he's saying here to people that she is arrogant he confessed um how do you know people asked and uh, then the narrator goes on to say that there was no proof but beauty is known to beget arrogance and uh, we come to know that kalimia is quite controlling in nature as well so he can't mm. submit to the will of others yeah uh maybe maybe he had been in a habit kalimia he had been in a habit of uh, being the center of attraction all the time in his family but now nobody was talking about him everybody uh um, they were talking about the bride and how she was beautiful so somewhere maybe he was uh, too scared to to lose the um, kind of importance he used to have in his family maybe he he thought he will be ignored of once he get uh married to that girl because everybody will talk about her i don't know yeah definitely there there is there are uh, certain places where we can see where he compares himself to herself which is so so um you know we don't uh, it was it's, it was something that i didn't expect uh, she men- he mentions that uh, her pale silken hands made his blood boil and he was overcome with an um, overpowering desire to grind in his blackness with her whiteness so that the difference between them would be obliterated forever so this is like you know he's comparing himself so much to her even the color mm. of the skin so he feels inappropriate that's what you're saying right yeah yes yeah uh, also there there is this point i think it is before that one about about the uh grinding of hmm. the mixing of the blackness and the whiteness that you talked about before coming there there was this uh 
sentence i think when he was very scared and he admitted to his friends kalimia that he won't be he doesn't want to get married yeah. and people try to make him understand and uh, how it will be different once he gets married and there was this sentence where it says she would say day if he wanted her to night if he wished it thus uh, she would sit wherever he made her sit and stand up if he ordered her to do so exactly so, yeah so that uh, says so much uh, about the kind of relationship society around them is expecting of this marriage and it is something which is still relevant yeah it's not it's not something uh, it's not a talk of the past even today it is there hmm it's the peak uh, the matriarchal is to, mo- yeah. moment in this story yeah yeah and it's it's so funny while you read it you know it's so true but you cannot stop laughing at it yeah because it's so true yeah no when the uh, when the celebration was going on people were singing those wedding songs even the songs were related to uh, a fair fight and a dark room so that also triggered kali mia in one way or another and uh, when we come further ahead in the story we see uh, how it is described when like a sword of out of its uh, sheath Sheep. ready for attack he entered the bridal chamber and saw the bride who was enmeshed in glittering red flowers he broke out in a sweat so a, a, a sword out of its sheath this phrase it say so much it was like he couldn't do anything when everybody were present around everybody he couldn't do anything he had to somehow live that yeah so he didn't like those songs and all those teasings which were those people didn't really have any intention of hurting kalimia hmm it was it was the but, truth it was the reality it was supposed to be a good thing maybe but uh, that wasn't the case he felt out of place maybe with this phrase where yeah. we where we see a sword out of his sheep maybe it is something like you know he fe- felt out of his place he didn't feel comfortable i don't know um actually uh, this phrase has been used to describe uh, the situation or you know the time when he was ready to enter the bridal chamber okay so yeah. it was as if hmm. whatever had to happen to me has already happened i have been insulted now yeah. it's my time because nobody would be there so yeah and i can i would be totally, the one yeah control rule. yeah yeah this again so, proves the point that he is so controlling uh, he controls everything yes. in his life yeah yeah maybe somewhere uh, at some point he might have uh, thought of that this is to be bright is so beautiful that he wouldn't be the one who would be the controller of that relationship and hmm. he could not accept it maybe that might also be a reason why yeah he, yeah he behaved the way he did uh so what do you think would be the reason now coming to this uh, bride bridegroom chamber where he has already entered and uh, he says lift your veil but uh, she does not uh, flinch at that so uh, what do you think would be the reason of her not lifting the veil as we can see in the story we haven't really been given any description about the nature of uh, the bride at all yeah we don't know What that was the first the paragraph was it the first paragraph was yeah. a little bit the and that that was it yeah and uh, the way we get to know about the nature and attitude of alimia we don't even get a glimpse of how the What's bride going is going on with the bride yeah yeah so it's very difficult to uh, tell the reason what, what do you think why didn't she lift her veil well we i I, th- i think there would be two three reasons to this maybe may, okay. I, we can just we can just guess here uh maybe because of um you know she doesn't want to uh, succumb to that uh kind of control that he wants to have um in in her life and mm-hmm. or maybe she does not she is that arrogant um 
or okay. maybe or maybe she has always gone by the rules of the society what is right what is wrong and this is what she yeah. has been taught not to uh, to be modest yeah. and to not act out of yeah. you know being impulsive and everything so maybe yeah three four reasons yeah maybe yeah maybe she is sim- simply very shy because yeah she has been told that she is not supposed to be the one who initiates it so yeah now he he fled to jodhpur as you said and yeah um right away he this is the second time he does this yeah the second time was when he came back after uh, uh, hearing that his uh, mother is mom sick yeah, yeah. Sick. and he comes back and people expect him to again you know uh, meet his wife but uh, yeah. yeah she refuses him again by not lifting the veil and he f- yeah. flees mm-hmm. to jodhpur jodhpur okay. again and, and you know um, before this on on the third page there is yeah. this um, sentence the women in the family knew the bride had not been touched this is before uh, his mother was sick so the way it is written the bride had not been touched it it sounds as if uh, you know the bride is the one who needs to be touched it is like you know it is it is so important uh to i don't know there is some kind of passivity those, there yeah yeah so even in the first para if you see uh the man's touch in a woman's life is so important yeah. so basically yeah. if you if if this bride uh didn't have those experience experiences in life then she was yeah. you know in a bad condition as she is yeah yeah maybe she wasn't but that's how the society views her okay so uh, pe- people again interrogated kalimia here she is defiant how do you know that so people say yeah. this remains the same how do you know that um i told her to lift the veil and she ignored my request you fool don't you know a bride does not lift her own veil okay yeah. so after that kalimia again disappeared for like 7 years because yeah uh, divorce wasn't an option an option yeah so. and uh, during meanwhile kalimia was uh, there's this phrase that is used there's this sentence here he indulged in all the vices that were available to him he consorted with prostitutes and homosexuals and among other things yeah. spent time as a pigeon yeah. fancier yes and goribai so. was goribi mm. goribai was smoldering away yeah so it's like uh, she could get all of it at only one place but he could go anywhere and everywhere to uh, get those that's things. that's the and kind of luxury uh, men had in yeah. those days also uh, because the girl wasn't touched the uh, bride wasn't touched there might be something wrong with the girl uh, it is assumed it is uh, being said yeah it is assumed and uh, we can see the sentence where it says what was wrong with the girl that the bridegroom had not touched her oh yeah so who has heard <laughs> such injustice of such injustice yeah. right so that's so true also um, i remember us talking about you know isma chuktai using the you know being a liberated liberal writer she writes about homosexuality and prostitutes in mm-hmm. um such mm-hmm. an easy way and at that time yeah. when it was so difficult mm-hmm. and yeah. yeah she has always portrayed men to have this kind of a luxury where they can just choose to be you know to go ahead with these kind of vices where mm-hmm. m- women for women their condition kind of led them to either be a homosexual or you know lead that kind of explore their sexuality the condition made maybe because the man in her life is not able to uh, give her those experiences or something like that even in lihav we noticed uh, that the begums 
husband was not was not mm-hmm. into her and he was a homosexual so that's why that led to her exploring her sexuality so we have so many instances of these things in her stories yeah even that time when his mother was uh, ill nothing happens is the same story she doesn't lift her veil and he goes away yeah and now he comes back when he is in his deathbed yeah and and before talking about that i want to say something here so uh, on page number 4 there is this uh, sentence when people are trying to uh, make guri be understand how it is not indecent to lift her veil if her husband asks her to do so yeah <laughs> yeah so he is your husband your earthly god it is your duty to obey your freedom lies in doing as he says so even here it's it's like if you do it without uh, your husband asking you to do so it is indecent it, it, it's it's not decent. appropriate yeah the so now they have bagged uh gone back on their words you can say i mean how uh convenient impulse how, how convenient how convenient yeah. to to just go back on the words and the customs and everything and just make rules as you go by uh seeing the situation here the same time when all the decorations and everything was done so that it could happen that couldn't happen 7 years ago could happen hmm. now but it again didn't happen and uh palimia said he's not going to, he's never going to show his face to goribi if he if she doesn't listen to him but she as usual didn't uh, even stir and palimia knocked the bedroom window open with a jab of his fist and jumped out into the garden never returned back went to jodhpur after palimia says that he is not going to show his face again to goribi he really doesn't show his face to her and mm. but he keeps sending money from jodhpur wherever he is working and living uh, why do you think kalimia did not lift her veil by himself after being denied three times because he is very arrogant and <laughs> he wants her to obey his commands yeah instead of doing it himself he wants her to do it okay. yeah Hmm. maybe he also has you know this kind of thing in mind that you might be very beautiful for others but if you want to be in this relationship you can you have to get rid of all that attitude and hmm. arrogance that you have of, okay. of your beauty <laughs> again controlling everything yeah. in the relationship so even in his deathbed so he is now apparently burdened with disease and uh, he after mm-hmm. leading a life of indiscriminate debauchery he returned home yeah. with disease the way the disease has been talked about it's uh, kind of very evident that he might be suffering from some sexually deadly disease which is related to yeah yeah sexually transmitted yeah. we as we as readers might be very sympathetic towards uh goribi and how uh, she had to suffer so much in a way we, we might feel it while reading it but this scene or this event that happens in the end it is the ultimate revenge that goribi takes because uh, kalimia wants to die uh, in peace but she doesn't let her let him so. yeah let him do so she yeah. she doesn't let him she is she as you told uh, this is the revenge moment for her but also at this point we are we as readers as you said we will be you know sympathetic but this point makes us believe that she doesn't need that sympathy because she is at last in control she has always been in control of her life by not yeah we yeah. cannot deny that part yeah and she stays true to all the customs i mean after kalimia took his last breath agoribi calmly sat down 
on the floor beside his bed and smashed all the glass panels as you're supposed to do in a Hindu household. And she took over widowhood, pulled the way, white veil of widowhood. So it's always been the veil has such a significance over throughout this story, literally as well as figuratively. Yeah, we can say veil is also a symbol here. Yeah, of um, course. Mm. of control taking control of one's life uh, we can also say that uh, veil in a way can be seen as an instrument used to control uh, the way a woman behaves yeah but here in this story guribi has used the same instrument against the ones who wanted to use it yeah to control her so it's like she has used the same instrument to resist the, resist the oppression. Rebel as well. Yeah. Kind of a protest from her side. Yeah. And that's so, so mind-blowing. <laughs> <laughs> this particular piece was translated by Tahira Nakwi. And we have so many more. The next one is the quilt that we have to read. And I'm so excited about it. 